Hello, and welcome to what's bubbling is in. I'm Inventor Dan Zen, and in this bubbling, we're going to take a look at some updates to Zim Physics. Zim Physics is a library, a supporting library, that you can find in the code section of the Zim site. So let's see an example. Uh, we'll um, take a look. We click that thing, and we use the arrows, and then, whoa, look at that. So what we've added is scrolling, both uh, vertically and horizontally. We've added scrolling to the physics and also a controller, and this is us using a controller here to make a pathway through all of these thousands of uh, little boxes. So do we have a path? There's the top. Let's break through. There we go. Good enough. And once we have a path, <laughs> aside from that, a little one in the way there, we can lock the track. And now as we go through, bonk, 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 we're, oh, we're stuck in there. We have a little pathway that we can navigate through. Fun, huh? Whee! Okay, so let's see how we did this then. We'll just close this down. We'll come into the code for our example, and we're using Zim 6.9.0 and Box2D. We brought in Box2D, and we're using Physics 0 0.3.0. So this is the update from a 0.2.1 or something like that. All right, and so we come on down. Now, when we make the physics, we've got a new parameter here. Let's just go in, dig right in, and show you that. That's, that's right here, this line right here. The fourth parameter now is whether the stage will scroll uh, with an object to follow the, the physics. Now, you can scroll the stage without actually following an object if you set this to true. And uh, that's kind of cool. So you could animate the stage, or you could uh, wiggle the stage, or whatever. That's that would be up to you. Normally, the stage, if we move it, it wouldn't map properly to the physics. So by setting this to true, we can move the stage. And one thing that's neat is we can use a couple new methods. So I'll just scroll down here, and we'll see the new methods. They're right here: control and follow. So if we say physics, well, if we say physics dot control ball, then we can use our arrows, the WASD, or the arrows to, to. Uh, move that ball. And there's a bunch of parameters there too that we'll take a peek at later. But if that ball is moving and it goes and moves off the, off the screen, then we can say physics.follow that object and it will scroll the stage so that you can still see that object. Neat, huh? Now, if we scroll the stage, that makes it a little bit difficult for interface. Say that button at the bottom that's supposed to stay at the bottom and say lock the track. So uh, locking the track is going to set the bunch of rec we made a bunch of rectangles. We'll see that. We made a bunch of rectangles, and when we hit lock the track, we want to turn those rectangles to be static. And when we unlock the track, we want them to be dynamic again. So we're need going to need the access to the rectangles across um, the two frames. Oh, I haven't quite mentioned that. Uh, this frame has a stage that's scrolling, so the easiest way to keep the interface from not scrolling on that stage is just to put the interface in a new frame. So we have one frame right here. We've, we're going to store the array for the rectangles outside of that so we can access it from the second frame, which is down here. So here's the second frame. There's not much in the second frame, really. It's just uh, the button. So the button has a label saying lock track. It toggles to unlock track. Um, when we click on the button, we're looping through all of the rectangles that we've built up above. We'll see that. Each time we get a rect body, and we're setting the rect bodies. Unfortunately, this is Box2D with their capital letter at the start methods. Uh, but anyway, we're depending on whether the button's toggled or not, we're setting that to a static body or a dynamic body. Okay, that's what's going on in the second frame. And that means we can just position this second frame like so. Oh, uh, frame 2 dot width, we, that means we don't even need these guys. I think I was uh, demonstrating that if, if you want, you can just access the frame 2's width and frame height. And do we put that right on the frame 2 stage? Yeah, so we don't even need the stage here. So we can get rid of those things. 
Cool. Or you could have put them in variables, but if we're not going to use them, that's the only place we're using them. <laughs> so if, if that's it, then maybe we just want to stick them right in there. Okay, let's go up and take a look at that physics stuff, though. Up, 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 up. All right, so we're coming into here. Oh, uh, we've made a backing rectangle that is four times the size of the stage width and stage height. And we've centered that, not center wedged, but centered it. Um, that's kind of important because that means the X and the Y of that backing will be way up there in the negative, you know, three times the stage width and stage height away from zero, zero. So, uh, so that we can see that we're moving on that backing. If it were all a solid color, we wouldn't be able to tell. Of course, that could be an image, a big image of space stars or something like that. Oh, that'd be so cool. Um, but what we've done is we put a gradient on that. So we've taken the backing's color command and added a linear gradient from pink to blue. And this means that those colors will start, it'll only be framed up pink right at the very edge and framed up blue right at the very edge. If you put 0.2 there or something like that, it would be framed up pink up to 20% uh, of the width and then start uh, in. But anyway, that's fine. We're, uh, and then we're uh, making a gradient along a line that starts at 0, 0 to 0 in the backing height. So that's a vertical line. So our frame dot pink and frame dot blue on a vertical line uh, makes our gradient, and we can see if we're going up and down because of that gradient. But to go sideways, to see that we're moving sideways, what we've done is access the graphics object of the shape of the backing. So the Zim rectangle here, the, the backing is a rectangle. It's got a shape property that allows you to access the actual CreateJS shape that was used, which is Zim shape, which extends a CreateJS shape, blah, 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 blah. Um, so we're accessing that graphics and we're going to set a stroke that is very transparent here. So that's a slightly dark stroke, 20 pixels wide. Uh, there's a hundred of them. And there's us working out the spacings, and then we're looping through those hundreds. And each time we're moving the stroke over a little bit and drawing a line to the height. So we move the stroke over a little bit, and we go from zero to the backing's height, and that makes those stripes. Then we cache the backing so we don't have to worry about storing anything to do with the gradient or anything to do with the, the stripes. It all just seems like a big image, which um, can be handled better in memory and so forth. Okay, so uh, then we're making a, this is the rectangle that we're going to pass into Zim Physics to say what bounds we should put on that. It's just a code rectangle. It's just an object literal saying X of this, this value and Y that width and height. And we, we may as well make those bounds match the backing image that we're putting on there. So there they are. Now, if we center regged, we would have to watch what we were doing here and here uh, would be, if we're center regged, it'd be that minus half the width. And, and that's why uh, just, just watch it. Okay, so we are then making the physics world, which we're passing in a frame, uh, the rectangle here, zero for the gravity. We could have set that to a gravity of 10 and had sort of real gravity and tried to keep things up, but yet we, we could be exploding things and looking way up in the sky, or it might be a flappy bird thing where we're flying all over the place, so gravity would have been fine. But we've got zero gravity, sort of like we're looking down on the top of something. And there's true for please set the stage to, to scroll. If, if, we, if we do something to it, then please scroll it. And now we're going to make a bunch of boxes of that size. So here they, uh, here it is. We're just making one rectangle and we're going to cache it. The reason why is when we loop through a thousand things, if we've just made one rectangle and cached it, we can pass that the cache canvas of that, uh, the box template there, the cache canvas of it to a bitmap, and that will only access the GPU once. So uh, that's cool. And that means we've got a thousand things, but only one access to the GPU which um, will help optimize this. Now it'll work just fine if you brought a Zim rectangle, if you put this rectangle right right in here, 
it would work just fine. That's how we started, and there was no performance problem. We even boosted that to 2,000 and no performance issues. But if you want to optimize, if it's a bit sluggish on your machine or something, you want to make sure that you um, are doing this as efficiently as possible. That's how you would do it. Okay, what we're doing is we're making a physics rectangle. You may have seen some physics before, but if not, uh, this is what physics can do for you. It can make a rectangle. That in Box2D is something like 20 lines of code, so you don't really want to use rocks. raw Box2D, I don't think. So we're um, calling a function to make a rectangle. We're calling that a box body. Anything to do with physics has body on the end, just by convention for the way we code. Uh, rectangles dot push the box body, so we're putting that physics rectangle into our rectangles array so that we can uh, control them all later from that button down at the bottom to make them static or dynamic again. We're then positioning the box bodies X and Y somewhere on the backing. Uh, these things, by the way, the physics rectangles are center regged, so we're um, Anyway, we're just finding a random place on there. We're coming back down here and we're making our Zim. So this is our Zim bitmap, which is really just one of the rectangles. And then we're center regging that on the stage. Now that will also center it on the stage, but immediately thereafter we're mapping the box to the box body. So this puts our Zim box here. Uh, at the same place as the physics box. And that happens constantly and right away. So uh, all is well there. Okay, now if we wanted to say tile these boxes, uh, these thousand boxes and tile them on there rather than randomly place them, then I would recommend we take this box, not inside this loop, but take this box and add it to Zim tile. So make a new tile, pass in the box, tell it the rows and columns, spacing if you want. And then it would position a bunch of Zim boxes all over the place, at which point afterwards, um, afterwards you would uh, loop through all of the children of that tile. So you would loop through the tile and place a physics rectangle at the location of the tiled rectangle. So flip it, do it in the other way around. Uh, and that would that would more easily make that. If you take a look at the Zim badges tutorials, Zim badges you can find in the learn section. There's a physics tutorial, and in the physics tutorial we make the uh, we make the tile boxes first, and then we add the physics bodies to where those are, and then we map them. Okay. Now we make a physics circle and put it on the stage, and then we make a Zim circle. Uh, uh, we don't have to really center reg that on the stage because Zim circles are centered. And we're adding a cursor as well. We're uh, then mapping the ball, our Zim ball, our Zim circle to the ball body. And this is what we're going to be controlling right here and following. So neat. These are the new things in Zim 3.0 or Zim physics 0.3.0. .0. And we want to also pop on out and see where we can see instructions on that and what other parameters are available. Uh, just quickly down here, the label. Did we look at all this already? I can't remember. Uh, anyway, we're just putting a click label on there. Uh, we're fading, we're animating that in. When we click, we're changing the text to say use arrows. We're setting a timeout to after we click and use arrow shows, we want that to fade away. Uh, also, if we just started using a key down, uh, we might want that to go away too. And there's the, um, each of them are calling the message off, which fades out the animate and removes, finally removes the thing. So it's a lot of, and sets the ball scores as a default. So a lot of normally, normally, normally there, isn't it? But anyway, that's, uh, that's how it goes for that little tricky beginning. All right, more, let's just see that beginning. So you remember that, we'll view this in a browser, open a browser. There's the ball, in comes click, I click on it and it says use arrows and that fades away and we're, we're off and running. So that was that part. Okay, let's see what other options we have with respect to the control and the follow. Uh, we probably won't go and play with those all that much, but uh, we may as well show you where you can find them. And, and that is you take a copy of this, 
That's the physics thing. You open up your browser and you paste it into your browser. And here it is. So the instructions are here. There's the scroll parameter, default false, set to true to be able to scroll the stage X and Y. That should read and. And this will let you follow physics objects, see the follow method. So under methods here, we have uh, the control method. So what object do you want to control? The type. So the type is both by default, and that means that um, WASD and arrows will run that, but you can set it to either be one or the other. Now that means you can control two things. So if we had two balls, uh, you could make one WASD and one arrows. In terms of following though, you can only follow one thing at a time. So uh, you can switch what you're following though, if, if you want to be clever about that. You might not even follow what you're controlling. You could be knocking something around and you could follow that something, yet your control things you're controlling uh, may or may not be in view. So there's various speeds. You can also set the speed to be different in the X and in the Y. So if you want them to be different, here's how you can override the speed Y. And that's kind of neat. So you can make something uh, move a lot in the X and Y, but hardly move any speed at all, or sorry, move a lot in the X, and then hardly move any speed at all in the Y, but some speed, uh, or set it to zero uh, for no speed. Uh, which really would be the same, I guess, as choosing horizontal and vertical. So no point in doing that, I suppose. Uh, horizontal and vertical default to true. So that means motion in both. But if you want only horizontal, then you would set vertical to false. All right. You can also turn off control by saying no control on that. And where'd our follow go? Uh, there's control. Huh. Uh, properties. Um, Oh, there it is. Sorry. Uh, are we wrapping here? Is that what's going on? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I couldn't recognize it because the text in the browser here is wrapping. So there's follow. This is all part of the parameter. So here's the parameters of follow right there. What object are we following? Damping. You can change the damping as well. So you can make it follow quickly in the X and Y or in the horizontal and make it follow slowly in the, in the Y or vice versa. Uh, the offsets, the offsets default to zero and the stage width and zero and the stage height. And what that's saying is that the object that's following will try and be put at that offset. So if we were going, uh, depending on which direction we're moving. So, um, if we were going to the right then we want the object to go more towards the left, uh, even right back to zero, try and get to zero, because as we're moving, um, there's damping that's happening and stuff like that. So probably best if you set that to zero. Now, if you wanted to, you could set this to stage width divided by two, stage width divided by two, stage height divided by two, stage height divided by two. And therefore, it would always try and go to the center. But you'll find that as you're moving away, the damping will uh, will make it so that it doesn't go to the center. And it ends up going uh, too far uh, or, or not quite far enough, I guess. So you, you can't see where you're going. That's what happens. You end up can't you can't see where you're going uh, because you're moving too fast and the screen's not catching up. So. Uh, by switching that uh, to the default here, I think you'll find a better solution. Now, border lock. Border lock means that uh, as it hits the end, if you've got a border, uh, we won't see beyond the border. Okay, let's just try that. And then there's border original as well. You can remove the border. Now, if you remove the board, a border, then border lock would no longer lock that and you would end up shooting off the end and so would anything else would shoot off the end which you may want or maybe you don't want to see that stuff shooting off the end if you don't want to see the stuff shooting off the end when the border's not there say you want to be able to push something off the screen but you don't want to go you don't want to see it pushed off the screen you want to get to it and push it off but not go any further visually uh, then you would use border original you set that to true, but by default that's false. Okay, so let's uh, see that. That was back here, I guess. Here we are. So border lock is what is causing push, 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 push. 
uh, the, not the fact that we bump into that, that's just the border, the fact that this didn't go any further. Uh, we may as well turn that off um, and just take a look at the turning it of, of it off. Also note that these things uh, that would be in the follow, these things use the Zim Duo technique of a configuration object. So uh, this is the OBJ comma and uh, what do we want to do? Um, we want to say border lock colon false like that. So now we've turned the border lock off. Uh, we can refresh this and take a look. Ugh. Push, 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 push. And there it is. So it's still following the ball, but you see how we've gone past the border, which you may like. I don't know. That's, that's all right. Depends. Some people kind of like that effect. I don't mind it. So that's what that's doing. And the other one we were dealing with, if you took the border off, if you took this bottom border off, uh, you would be able to push things through it and you would be able to, it would keep on following it. Follow, 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 as long as uh, you didn't set the uh, border original to true. If you set the border original to true, then it would lock there and all the stuff would get pushed off the bottom, including the thing, would, uh, your ball would go off the bottom as well, but it wouldn't, the stage wouldn't follow it anymore. It would uh, stay locked to the original border before you remove the border. <laughs> I think that's uh, probably good enough for your brains. What do you say? Wasn't that fun though? Do you like this? I kind of like it. It's a uh, neato mosquito. So uh, I am Inventor Dan Zen. We've been here at a What's Bubbling at Zim. And that is the new physics uh, library that's available on zimjs.com slash code. To, or is it code.html? Anyway, the code section of Zim. If you scroll on down to the libraries, uh, there it is there. It's there with the 3D library. It's there with sockets and so forth in a game library, etc. All right. Have a great day. Ciao.